So um, welcome everyone. Uh, let's maybe thank everyone here uh, in the room and also online because this is a, one of the hybrid sessions that we are having here at ICL. So it is my great pleasure as a member of the local organizing committee here for the International Congress um, of Linguists that is happening in Poznan. And it is collocated, our workshop, our Vila's workshop is collocated with um, the, um, the Congress, the huge, huge Congress that takes uh, several hundred of uh, participants. So we are warm, warm, warmly welcoming everybody here in the room and also online. Uh, we, we are going to have both uh, online and in-person presentations uh, during the uh, VLAT panel. Um, well, from the local uh, committee, I would just like to say that uh, we are very happy to have you all. This is the 21st Congress um, on linguists, uh, and the Congress has a very long tradition as it takes place on uh, once every five years. Uh, so uh, it's, it was started, the tradition was started in 1928 already, and soon there's going to be 100 uh, anniversary of this whole uh, conference. So we are very happy uh, and Frank will tell a bit more about it in a second, um, I'm sure. We are very happy that the VLAT uh, workshop can take place, place within this big, big um, conference that we can perhaps make new connections, that we can um, exchange uh, our knowledge also with uh, the um, ITO participants. Yeah. So now I hand over. Thank you, Katia. Yeah. Yes. Okay, wonderful. And um, it's also nice to see um, quite some people here in the room, um, and maybe more will come up. Uh, my name is Henk van den Heuvel. Uh, I'm a Claren uh, um, a board member. Um, and this um, um, meeting, this workshop is organized by uh, Claren together with Daylot. So uh, what we'll do first is explain a little what Claren is for those of you who are not quite familiar with it. Um, and then we will smoothly go over to Delat and the first um, um, presentation that we will have um, explaining the latest developments at Delat and the things we have been organizing for you, for your researchers, we think you can take your benefits uh, from. Um, so um, at some point during my presentation, I will hand over to Satu Salasti, Salasti and then um, I will um, um, uh, briefly again tell you something about CMGI later. Um, but I think we'll have a smooth um, uh, hand over there. So what I would like to do now is uh, to um, share um, uh, a brief presentation here. Uh, by the way, online participants, welcome to have you here. It's great. We, most of you, we had some communication already, uh, and some of you I know now only by email, but now only I see faces uh, with, attached to them. It's a very great experience to have it. Okay, now briefly about Claire and Eric and its uh, infrastructure. Uh, so um, Claren is, uh, is an abbreviation for Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure. It's a long-standing infrastructure, actually, uh, since 2012. Um, and the idea is that we um, set up an infrastructure, both for scholars in the humanities and social sciences, to have access to digital language data resources and tools to explore, exploit, annotate, analyze, and combine data and um, use them for, for research. Uh, and we do this in an uh, infrastructure with a sign-on uh, environment. Um, so um, we are very active in, in shaping the open science cloud. Um, there are several links also during this presentation, which can give you some more uh, information uh, about this. Um, Claren is a federative organization consisting of uh, 70 centers um, um, distributed around with 24 members. I think it's a bit more now even, uh, and some observers. Um, I, I think uh, UK will also um, join us uh, uh, shortly. Uh, third parties are there. Um, one of the partners we had was CMU at um, 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 Carnegie Mellon, um, and we also have uh, an observer, I think, in South Africa. Okay, so what we offer is data tools, models, and metadata, high quality, uh, and to make them accessible, to know at what, what access levels you have, 
in order to um, approach these uh, data and use it for, for your research, um, which means active collaboration, knowledge exchange, uh, fair network and beyond. So it's not just that we um, have a big um, um, a site where you can look at data and tools, but we also want to train you in using them and, and have a, building a network around it. We do this by an annual conference. It will be next year in Barcelona, next year, next month in Barcelona, uh, by events like Claren Cafes, uh, teaching and training uh, uh, workshops, um, and through our knowledge uh, centers. Um, and when it comes to centers, we have uh, several ones. We have the big data centers, and the B is strange not, strangely not for big, but for data. <laughs> they they are the places where we um, uh, put our resource, our language resources, and where they can be accessed. Uh, C centers are centers which uh, dispatch uh, metadata, but only metadata. And then, of course, when it comes to the data, they point through the metadata to the location where the data are located, and the knowledge centers. Uh, and you can get an overview of, uh, of that uh, using this uh, link. Um, so all presentations, of course, will be made available to, uh, to the uh, participants and, um, and, and wider. Um, so if you would like to know more about our data centers and the access levels and licenses, there's a link. And we have several knowledge centers, which you can also uh, check out. And uh, the websites uh, also allow you to filter uh, for specific um, uh, topics where you might be interested in. Welcome, some more people coming in. So that's very nice. So um, talk about knowledge centers. One of these is uh, the Knowledge Center for Atypical Communication Expertise, uh, which is hosted at Radboud University in Nijmegen um, and, and working together with um, other partners uh, like the Language Archive uh, Max Planck Institute, which is a B center, and also with the Talk Bank uh, CMU. Um, so this, what we call ACE, is really atypical communication and we, uh, Specialize on uh, uh, typ typical atypical communication that you encounter during language acquisition or uh, language attrition uh, and in language disorders. Um, so um, we are dealing with very sensitive uh, language resources here. And that's why when it comes to um, resources with language and speech disorders, the collaboration with DELAP is so important for us. Um, because this is an initiative started in 2015, I think, already um, uh, sharing and sharing corporate individuals with communication disorders. Um, and we have a website, which you probably have visited already in, in uh, preparing for this uh, for this workshop. And the link is there as well. Hi to everybody here and online. Good to see you and good to have you. Um, hope this is for the new... Um, new friends of dear lads hope this is the first time for many uh, because uh, we have been able to create a community talking about um, issues often challenges <laughs> but also um, uh, good practices in sharing data um, related to communication disorders uh, which is, of course, specific data often um, containing sensitive information. And as Hank just mentioned, um, I think DELAD was um, started 2015 um, to uh, collect and share corpora of speech with disorders. And I think it was Nicole Miller and... Um, uh, Martin Ball, who originally started, and then uh, up within the years, we all became involved. And the current steering group uh, is Henk, our, our leader, then me, Satu Salasti, and I'm from the University of Eastern Finland. Uh, Finland, and I also have had the pleasure of acting as a foreign ambassador. And then we have uh, Kasia, who was welcoming you, and uh, Nicole Bessel and Alice Lee, maybe online. But we, even among us, we represent quite a mixed group, I think. I'm a speech and language pathologist collecting data with 
um, children, youth, and adults with speech impairments, and there's phoneticians, linguists, um, uh, and I think that that's one of the best sides of Dale Art that we have um, also technical personnel who can share their knowledge uh, and help us with the technical side of issues. And we've met um, um, regularly, almost yearly, with these workshops and uh, uh, have different topics, for examples, um, examples of different communication um, disorders, guidelines and uh, to collect data, ethics and legal aspects. We have talked a lot about. We have also have uh, had uh, visiting lawyers to help us with, with these issues. Um, levels of how to anonymize data, or how to access data securely, um, and all the kind of issues that researchers have magically have to know, uh, but they are quite new to us. So that's why we we it's important that we have um, collaborators that knew know more than than we do. And since two thousand seventeen, we have been under Clarin um, uh, as a as a case um, center um, originally, uh, but. The goals of the initiative to start with were were to find ways as smooth as possible uh, to share data if, with um, a GDPR compliant way because it was a challenge that we we um, all faced all, all of a sudden uh, and um, how to archive data securely um, and with with different sort of um, access as, as mentioned before and the data takes various forms as we know it, it can be audio it can be visual and those are already personal personal data and so uh, you can't share them freely but of course transcriptions are a bit easier and annotations but then we have also instrumental data um, that can be acoustic ultrasound images of uh, tongue movements um, or uh, other kind of speech imaging data, even brain imaging data. And um, of course, so that the data should be findable and easily accessible, we have also tried to figure out what kind of metadata we need to connect with uh, with it and how to control it. Um, and our, I, I guess it, it's safe to say that with scientific practice, usually it is the best thing to, to share things with colleagues and not to think about these things alone. So we also um, try to allow ways to teach with these um, our, our data and we even have uh, made uh, a teaching video of uh, data management which can be openly used it's, um, and uh, of course networking is a very important side of of these workshops um, so now we at first part of of our two day workshop is this introductionary part, but then we'll have a coffee break, and uh, after that we have researchers taking the platform and um, uh, explaining their uh, the ways that they have uh, dealt with these issues. Uh, and of course, we also have a website, um, which. If you haven't visited, please do. We have tried to collect links um, there to help. Uh, we'll, we can have a look at it if we have time. And But currently we are a Clarion K Center for atypical communication expertise, as Hank mentioned. 
and uh, that is we connected with the language archive at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics, and also we have connections with the Talk Bank, uh, which uh, has a, a lot of speech impairment related data. Um, as uh, we have collected different examples of consent forms, um, annotation guidelines, uh, and that teaching uh, role play video, uh, and they can all be accessed via our website. Um, but we do work <laughs> between the workshops as well, and there have been some advancements which is uh, which we are now sharing. Um, um, I'll go ahead for a while. Um, what we have been doing is that the idea of uh, sharing data and having corpora of disordered speech is the first thing to start with, but then it's also, they should be findable um, so that people could use them. And um, we wanted to create a Clarin Research family page where we collect information of all uh, data sets uh, or corpora related to speech impairments that people would find them and could hence use them more easily. easily. Um, and uh, yeah, we have, we had this project for uh, about six months and we are towards finishing it. And that's why we, uh, we are quite happy to, to share the results or, or our, of our work with you. Um, but first of all, we had um, previous collections that were registered with our uh, web page, um, and they can still, or some of them can still be uh, seen there, but it, they will be moved to the, the resource family page. Um, and we have um, listed, also included, uh, Talks Plank, Talk Bank's uh, clinical data sets. They are related on aphasia, um, autism, fluency, psychosis, for example. Mm, and the reason for collecting all this information is that they can be found via Clarins uh, VLO uh, function. I don't know if you are familiar with Clarins VLO, the people here in the no. Um, would be the first mark. I can do it later. Okay, okay. Yeah, to show how it actually yeah. works. No. Yes, yeah. Um, and then we also uh, distributed an online uh, questionnaire with our um, within our networks to collect potential data sets so we can all have them listed um, in in there. Um, yes, yeah, so as that was already uh, uh, telling, um, uh, the idea is that we will have but collect all kinds of um, resources and bring them together in this resource family page. So mentioning TalkBank here, um, we, we looked indeed what is already there in, in the Clarin uh, Glow with the Virtual Language Observatory, um, what's already in, um, in other uh, repositories like ELRA, which is uh, the European Language Resources Association. And there are lots of materials as well, but not so much on pathology as it turned out. Uh, but And we also use an online questionnaire um, so we asked people already in the Dela community uh, about their resources uh, and if they're still accept accept accessible and if, we, if they could update the information uh, that we have now. 
Um, but we also spread this questionnaire more wide uh, among the clearing community and all, all kind of uh, um, uh, network uh, associations um, to, to add more information and to get a hold of more uh, data sets. Um, and, and also, since there are already uh, resource families around uh, for other materials, there could be overlaps with, uh, with, uh, with, for example, there's one for spoken corpora, and that might also include uh, corpora with uh, speech uh, or language disorders. So this is what we also have, uh, have been uh, looking at. Now, the idea was that um, we would have this, um, this resource family page, and all the resources listed there were had their... Um, say, um, uh, counterbalance in the virtual language of Turkey. So they could also be found in the virtual language of Turkey. And this was already true uh, for all uh, the material that was in the talk bank, clinical bank, because they are, um, uh, and I should say were, um, uh, a care and C center, which uh, dispatched and uh, made their um, uh, metadata harvestable uh, for the virtual language observatory. So we said, okay, for the other uh, resources that we find and which are not yet in the virtual language observatory, we are going to make these uh, met metadata pro um, uh, files uh, and have these metadata files in CMDI, which is um, the uh, format that is used typically used in the in this virtual language observatory. So CMDI is a component metadata infrastructure. And that's what, what the abbreviation stands for. Um, and here's a link which you connects you to all this uh, information about CMDI. Um, it, it's an interesting thing because it's a kind of hierarchical structure. So you can use modules with uh, metadata and put them in another profile and use them again. And that, that comes very handy uh, sometimes. Um, and that's what we also did for um, this uh, new profile, which we developed typically for um, uh, language resources for speech and language uh, disorders. Um, so it was based on an already given a collection a profile that we have, and we extended this one uh, a little with um, metadata that we typically uh, use or want to use for this type of uh, resource. So the nice thing is if you have such a metadata um, and you can point to where the resources are and you have them in the virtual language observatory, this is very good for the verification. So making your data fair. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible, um, because it will give a, a, a persistent, persistent identifier to the da data, data and also to the metadata, in fact. Uh, and it will show how how the how you can access the data. And that's very important and gives you information about the formats um, and, and documentation if available. So um, we think this whole fair um, uh, verification process is very relevant also for our data, which is otherwise so hard to get. And so really, if you want to make this as, as visible as possible and to also to share how accessible it is. Uh, and sometimes it's not very accessible and sometimes it's much more accessible. Um, so as I told you, we had this uh, CMDI profile um, uh, and then we extended it for our specific profile with language and speech and uh, metadata. So what does it mean? Okay, for speech sound disorders and language disorders, we have two ex uh, extra components. The speech sound disorders, um, uh, for each data set, we can now indicate um, uh, whether the data set is about developmental dysarthria, dyspraxia, and so on. Um, when you're in the field, not really, um, I hope this uh, this speaks uh, for you. Um, we also know that when it comes to making this classification of speech sound disorders, um, uh, experts differ in, in how they would uh, term them and how they would classify them. Um, so um, um, we did our best to, to make something uh, good out of it, but um, we are always open for comment and feedback on this, where perhaps you say that you forgot something very important here. Um, so um, we have this, um, these uh, categories, and uh, one of the categories is speech sound is associated with, uh, and then uh, there's this subcategory where you can say, okay, this is associated with this and that. And um, it's also relevant to notice that you're not confined to being able just to pick one of these. 
some data sets, uh, if, if they have more than one disorder in them, uh, which can even appear in one person, for, uh, you can click multiple lines. So that's also something for you to know that this, this facility is there. And it comes to um, language disorders and delay, we have um, this list of uh, uh, categories of language delay, developmental language disorder. So what you see here is an um, uh, element, element that is the way of implementation in the CMDI, right? So uh, the real categories, language delay, developmental language disorder, Asia language disorder associated with, again, and then we have, we have the list of uh, and um, possible um, uh, related phenomena. Okay, um, now this uh, resulted in a new profile, which is here, the link is here. So when you're clicking the link, you can go to this uh, profile and, and see it. Um, I think you'll be hovering over it, you already can see uh, very small letters, uh, what it is. Um, so as I told you, we were aware that some of the data resources in the corporate that we found, they were not yet in virtual language of therapy. And for those, and I think it's 11 in total, we said, okay, we are going to make this uh, metadata uh, record based on this new corpus collection for CSD. So we built the profile and that's this one. And then we populated it into several records, each for these resources. Um, so this is uh, what we did, and I, I know some of these resources are uh, were, were built by people attending this uh, workshop, so that, that's a good thing to know. Um, but for example, we have uh, uh, speech sound disorders, we have, oh, I'll not go too quickly. Um, we, we could go to the flow and we can see whether they are there, because what we did, uh, we made this uh, metadata record, and then what we did, is we put them in uh, uh, the C center where we are at the Radboud University, CLST, so that the metadata records are now harvested uh, and put into the virtual language of the uh, um, So what was one of the uh, um, each disorder? Maybe this was one that we had. No, oh, but I have to spell it as well. Speech, speech sound. Yeah. So here uh, you have the ultra speech sound disorders, which was one added uh, by us. So, uh, and the seed one is also one added by us. So you can go there now um, uh, and find more information. So this is some basic information uh, with a description of this resource, but you can also go to all metadata. And then uh, the interesting thing is that what you see here is exactly the structure of the CMGI profile that we developed. Um, and what we did, we collected the information that we need for the uh, Claren Resource Family page and then copied it into this um, uh, metadata record for, for, the, for, for the corpus. So what you see then, okay, the sound and the audio format and those goes down. And here you see language that's associated with, perhaps you should go and also make this better visible for, for what it is associated with. Uh, the language name, the open access, and here you, you see the, the links to the, to the data itself. Um, so this is a, a way that you can now access uh, the type of data. So here's the C database, um, and you can also say, okay, let me see all metadata, and um, you can go down here and, and, and see the rest of the information, the number of speakers, and so on. So, um, this is uh, what, what, what makes the um, uh, metadata interesting. Um, but of course, um, uh, one of the things we did not quite foresee, and I, I will uh, go back to the presentation now. So this is what we did already. Um, I showed you the virtual language observatory. And again, this um, uh, results in this new resource family, uh, Corpora for um, uh, Disordered Speech. And I will, we will go to the link uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, because now it's a bit dangerous if I do, because then I lose you again. So let's first collect, uh, co go to the slide and see. Okay, so we have an overview of 30 corpora all in there. And nine uh, were corpora already in existing Claren repositories. We have seven main collections from Corkbank. So these are really main collections. Underneath each of these collections, there's a lot of 
talk, right? If you know talk bank, you know that this um, is only, say, a kind of a series under which you have all kinds of languages and, and a several corpora of each of these collections. So a corpora from the existing DLF inventory and the survey that we sent out and got extra material. Um, and then 11 additional corpora and other uh, repositories. So this means that we now have a broad range of speed sound disorders in, in, in the overview, as well as language disorders. Um, a range of language families are represented. Uh, English is still pro predominant, as I think it's in, in all kinds of um, uh, families. Um, the data sets cover examples from speech sound disorders in children or parallel data sets from hearing and hearing impaired results. Um, and the modalities may uh, differ and uh, um, vary across different types of audio, video, acoustic, and articulatory data. Um, so here, um, is the new um, uh, resource family, corpora disordered speech. What we do, we explain a little about what these corpora are and how we set up this um, uh, resource family. Um, we already told you in this presentation how we did this and also for the CMVI profile that we developed. And then here you see all these um, corpora and uh, families coming up. So in, you see the languages, uh, you see here the aphasia bank, so you could use this to go to uh, talk bank, uh, and uh, there we go back. Um, then here we have the way to access the data, either download or browsable. Um, and here is, is the whole lot of data, and it goes down and down and down. Um, so a uh, corporate of disordered speech, we explain how uh, it was made, um, and I just told you in the presentation, uh, also with the separate CMDI profile. Um, and uh, then here, uh, so we have the contact person. So if you would like to add your corpora here, contact these people, they will help you. So it's Alice Lee and Nicola Bessel, they are also in this meeting. Um, so uh, that's the way to go. And here you see these, uh, so it's 30 of them, um, and you can here click to the landing page of each of them, um, and uh, there's a lot of talk bank, here's the aphasia bank, and you can, here is the way to connect to the data, so it's browsing or downloading um, uh, and getting to the, to the website where this is all possible then. Um, so this is, uh, I think, a rich source now, which has been developed, so this is the fluency bank, for example, you can go there. And some of you will, of course, know this already. Um, and you can start browsing it if you like. I don't know if, we, if everyone sees this, but um, okay, you need to log in for TalkBank. That's uh, that's the way it goes, of course. Uh, but then you can do the browsing. So, and there's a lot of data now uh, combined here. We have, some of them are not uh, quite accessible, but, but you have the uh, landing page so that you can at least have the, the metadata and connect, uh, make connection to the authors. Um, so I think this is a rich source now that we have been able to, uh, to um, open up. Uh, and that was the whole idea by, for having such a, a, a resource family. So it is part of the larger um, resource families. So this is the resource families. And so it will be uh, one, it, they will shortly connect uh, the new one here uh, to be part of this corpora. So there are a lot of different uh, resource families and this is the one uh, we can always access it. Then let's go back to the presentation. Uh, and so the future is really, we open up this and, and really encourage you to uh, contribute to, to this. If you have data resources, which you would like to have, on this resource family page and to have this dissemination space, then please contact us. Um, and then um, I, I give the floor to you, Satu, with the survey that yeah. you have started. Because we started our journey 2015 and there have been some developments and um, um, we want to know what are the current potential challenges or how has it been? Um, in what what are the experiences in data sharing? And now, how many of you do research on clinical data, on data with speech and language um, disorders? Yes, quite a few. How many of uh, you doesn't have to apply for the um, speech disorders uh, have shared data? How many of you? 
even even less. Yes. Um, so now we would really want to identify the key factors that potentially hinder you sharing data or maybe has helped somebody to share data. And that's why we are, have prepared a questionnaire. It is totally anonymous. So we don't collect any personal information or anything. Um, and uh, this is a sentence that ethical board wants to uh, add to this because I asked that there's there's no ethical review done on this uh, survey because it's not needed. Um, but we would really appreciate if you would um, um, answer the, our questionnaire and let us know uh, if you have shared data um, or if not, and what have been issues around it. There's only 22 questions and then open comments. Feel free to, to leave um, any comments. Maybe I um, leave this now and then we intend to share the results of this survey um, either in a workshop or in a, a conference or maybe in a publication. But to collect data on, on what is actually going on currently. This is um, our website where you can find um, information about us, about workshops, current and past. Here's the current workshop with um, uh, and then we have listed partners. If you want to become a partner, please um, approach us by sending email or there, there's a link somewhere. Yes, in here you can contact us um, if you want to ask something related to data sharing or anything. And then if you want to join the initiative, you can uh, make um, not an application because everybody's welcome. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, you can leave your information. And then if you want to offer your data sets, there's also a um, link for that. And here's, you can see some of the previous workshops that we've had. And then um, here are some of the material that we were explaining previously. For example, the role play link of a, uh, it's a video that you can use for teaching uh, data management. And there's also a link to our publications. Um, when it comes to a guideline, so this is indeed the role play video where uh, there's a um, very specific uh, thing, which is called the data protection impact assessment and w uh, with a role play. For example, uh, you have a kind of data which is sensitive and someone else would like to use it and uh, would like you to share it with them. Uh, then there's a kind of data protection impact assessment that you that you do, uh, especially when it's sensitive data. And this is a role play uh, where we uh, have everything together, also the materials to do to organize something like this for yourself with students uh, to to do such a role play. So next uh, week, I'm going to do this again with some um, Italian colleagues uh, in, in one of their projects uh, because it's uh, really entertaining, but you learn a lot from it uh, by taking positions of stakeholders in such a, um, uh, a question um, where you have to deal with issues of, okay, but what do the ethics committee think, committee thinks about it? What is the role of the archive? What is the role of the data subjects, the, the participants themselves or the representatives? Would they agree to do something like this? And is the data, can it be shared in a safe way? These kind of stuff. Um, other guidelines we have on are on storage uh, and uh, sharing data, issues to consider, what should be in your ethic form, uh, application form, what to consider here. Um, uh, examples of um, uh, forms that you can use if you would like to make um, um, 
informed consent uh, forms, et cetera, et cetera. So it was carefully put together with um, all kinds of stuff here. So um, we uh, it's our way of uh, serving uh, every one of you and helping you in, in, in getting sharing uh, data done for this typical type of data, which is so hard to share. But I think that concludes our presentation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, ca I can add something because that is a, um, a recent development. Um, I told you that uh, the whole setup was that all resources that we have on a resource family page would be uh, also findable in the VLO. Um, and um, since everything that was in TalkBank was already in the VLO, we only uh, limited ourselves for to making a new CMDI files for the, those that were not yet there. Uh, but recently, seen you uh, withdrew as a uh, Karen a member. Um, I know, don't know, you probably know TalkBank and how important Brian McWinney uh, is for that. And he is very close to his retirement uh, and has to scale up his activities. And this part uh, could not be taken over by uh, someone else. And there was a lot of handwork for him also to make these CMDI files. So we are going to lose the CMDI files for uh, the TalkBank uh, uh, resources. Uh, and that's a pity because it was a kind of contrary uh, how we uh, thought we could uh, work things out. But you can also approach it from the other side and saying, hey, uh, otherwise the, these resources would not have been found, found findable uh, for Claren at all. But now we have this resource family page and there they are all listed. And this is also a way to get access to them and also a way to get access to the metadata because you can go directly to the source at TalkBank itself. So. Um, in a way, um, uh, it's a pity that this happened. And in the other way, uh, it's very good that we now have this resource family because it, uh, again, establishes the access to the uh, to these resources uh, that are very important for our community. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. So I hope you had a good coffee break. Um, and that next, we'll have uh, our researchers to share their recent experience in sharing their uh, corpora of disordered speech. First, we have Lowe's Van Bemmel, uh, uh, Maastricht University. Then we'll have uh, Kasia and Anita present their um, experiences and Marina is online and will uh, share her talk um, online. And each of these presentations will have 20 minutes and about 10 minutes to, for discussion. So, uh, so very happy to be here. Also, hello to the people online and in the room. Uh, I'm Luz van Bemmel, and I'm here from the Netherlands, uh, Maastricht University. Um, and my first slide is actually a bit about me uh, because I think I have a very interesting background that might with a unique perspective about it. Um, my background is in artificial intelligence and data science at Dublin University. Um, where I also came in touch with speech analysis and um, more about the language research. Um, and currently I'm a PhD student at Maastricht University and Maastricht University Medical Center um, at Respiratory Medicine. So uh, <laughs> quite some nice background work. Um, so I first worked as an academic and then now I'm really situated in the hospital and I run clinical studies as well. So I have some experience um, about how that goes and also why the data sharing is that difficult from the, uh, uh, the hospital side. So I don't think I have to convince you why speech data is important, um, but I am particularly interested in paralinguistic features in speech. Um, so features about the speaker, not what is said in the content, but about what is said from the speaker. Um, and also voice data and speech data is easy and cheap to collect and analyze. And people don't really realize that yet in a hospital. Um, it's also rich signal, as you know, deep neural networks and AI classification work very well. So specifically, my research is about COPD. It's about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, it's a pathology. It's not really a voice or speech pathology, but it does, but it does impact the speech quite a bit. Um, I do not have the exact figures, but it's the third leading cause of death worldwide and also in Europe. So it's quite a big population of patients. And very interestingly, um, for speech, 
is the lung attacks. So these are exacerbations of symptoms. Um, and a lot of patients deal with these. And um, they're very difficult to predict and also to detect. So lung attacks are the most interesting um, thing to analyze because unfortunately during these events, the quality of life goes down quite a bit for the patients and often it leads to hospitalizations or even death. Um, but luckily, if we diagnose them early and detect them early, it improves outcomes. So they can get their medication earlier um, and they worsen less, let's say like that. Um, however, they're very difficult to diagnose, as I said. Clinicians don't agree on the definition of a, an exacerbation or a lung attack. And also early symptoms are very difficult. But one thing that uh, people use is spirometry, um, but they're very invasive for the patients. And of course, speaking is very easy. Um, so in Maastricht University, we have a few um, projects running and it's all about CBD, people with CBD in their self-management uh, in the context of an app that people use at home. Uh, for CBD patients, I put this as a point because this is an older population, a little bit less health literate, a little bit less digitally literate, um, quite a challenge sometimes. And specifically, my project is about using an algorithm that detects or predicts lung attacks from speech. Um, so as I mentioned, we have several projects running. They kind of overlap. So Tatikas is now finishing up. Speak is my PhD project. So I'm in the, my second year now. And that's is a longer running project to also get something on the market, hopefully. Um, and within these projects, of course, we want to share data. Um, so an algorithm made with data collected in the Toxicals uh, project, we want to use both for Speak and Vessel. Uh, any findings of Speak are also taken into Dassel because why would you not use those findings, right? However, there's quite some barriers of using these data. Um, and clinical research is quite different from what I was used to from university. Uh, so you're all familiar with the GDPR. We also in the Netherlands have the WMO, which I will get into. Uh, any research has to go through the MRAC. We also have the MDR, the medical device regulation. And once an app does some kind of decision making that's medically relevant, it actually is a medical device. So that comes with a lot of legal baggage um, that I'm sure people have to deal with as well. CE marks, it all goes, uh, there's quite a bit. And also the faculty and the participants themselves are of course stakeholders in this. So GDPR, uh, it was touched upon already. Um, it's about personal data and speech is identifiable unless heavily pre-processed. And even then, is it pseudonymized uh, or even anonymized or encoded? Is that possible? I would say for research, if you want to use it for different goals, you want as rich the you want to keep the signal as rich as possible. So you want to share everything you can. Um, and of course, because I do research on respiratory disease, we also want the clinical characteristics, which is medical data, which is a spe special category of data within the GDPR. Um, two colleagues of mine um, they can have aggregated kind of the GDPR into these um, yeah, things. Um, and most interestingly, I think the clinicians look to purpose limitations, storage limitation, and data minimization. Um, these are very big for the clinicians. Okay, so specifically in the Netherlands, we have the WMO, which is the Medical Research Invol Involving Human Subjects Act. And it applies to any research that involves human subjects if, if, if the people are subjected to actions or rules of behavior are imposed on them. And also speaking into an app, if it's quite frequently enough and for long enough, that's rules of behavior and subjected to actions. Um, so, for example, our Toxicals research was 12 weeks long, three times a day, something people speak into an app that was already uh, part of the WMO. Um, and that basically requires a very intensive ethical um, process before it can start, uh, which has to go through the MREC, which is the Medical Research Ethics Committee. Um, so, just to give an idea, a proposal you submitted to the MREC and something that does not fall within the scope of the WMO takes about four to six weeks to um, 
yeah, before it gets approved. Um, and that's just the first approval. If you have any adaptations that still needs to be made, it doubles or triples. And then for a WMO, uh, there's some legal uh, bounds within the time. It's two months for to a max of 112 days. However, my colleague has, uh, it's an amendment. So uh, um, something already got approved, but they wanted to add something. They uh, applied for it in February and it's still not back. So, and you can't add the things to your research before it's approved. So yeah, it takes quite a while. As I said, there's a research proposal to the MREC, so typical research proposal, very importantly, which I will get onto uh, much more, is the uh, information form. So the information form already touched upon as well, that you have some examples for that, that's great. And the informed consent, which is part of that. Um, so informed consent is usually the legal basis of data processing within the GDPR. And it's necessary if the research is in the scope of WMO in the Netherlands. And it's also necessary if you're collecting medical data, which is what we want to do. Um, and it's uh, for the C3 people, especially, it needs to be understandable language and complete. And because C3 uh, population is usually lower socioeconomic status, you really need to make sure that they understand information that they're getting. And then for clinical research, I never heard of this before. I don't know if that's something you are familiar with, but any information form that is signed physically also has to be signed by a researcher training with clinical practice. So that's an entire uh, course someone has to do before they're able to sign off on the ICFs for medical research. This is the example, yeah. This is the example of the um, Toxicos information form. And you can already imagine if you're say 70, 70 years old, and you think, oh, I want to donate my voice for research, and you get this form and you're like, oh, wow, maybe not. Um, so the informed consent, uh, subject information informed consent contains a lot of information. What's most interesting for us is what happens to the subject's data, of course. Um, we have to sit, share all of this in our subject form. I already um, got a lot of comments like, oh yeah, I didn't read it. Uh, but sure, I want to participate. And legally speaking, I have to read it for them then. But in practice, you just say, okay, if you agree, then you know the general terms, right? Um, so for Tacticas, which is, again, the first research where we wanted to use the data for the other research, this is part of the subject information and informed consent. They were able to opt in into giving permission to use their data for other research as described in the information form. And in the information form, it specifically states that it only contains, um, pertains to scientific research on asthma or COPD, which is great, that's fine. This is the purpose limitation of the GDPR. Clinicians love this. However, this means that it's not possible to do this with, in a different scope. We cannot use the data because they didn't give consent, uh, informed consent to it. So is it not possible to change the informed consent? Of course it is. We didn't accept it amendment to the MREC, which takes months sometimes. Um, and if you want to use previously collected data for a new purpose, you have to either ask for written informed consent again, uh, and you have to write a new application anyway for any new research, also for previous data. Um, but also, the uh, last point, um, if they have not given their informed consent, um, you cannot use their data for any purposes that are not covered within the initial informed consent. You have to either contact them again, which is impractical for everybody, or you have to kind of give up. That's basically your options. Um, so even within these three projects where it's the same people working together, right? But there's multiple data transfer agreements. Every new research needs its own MREC approval. And for previously collected data, sometimes it's impossible to use it. Um, this is, of course, all about thinking beforehand what you want to use the data for in the future. But the ethical approval is very conservative in giving permission for a broad purpose. So how we want to change this. 
uh, within my uh, project, the Speak project, uh, we want to develop an algorithm using the Tacticas data because we specifically look uh, towards COPD patients this is possible. And we eventually want to deploy the algorithm in an app within the Speak project. However, um, we want to validate and test the algorithms, of course, with outside data. So we want to gather more data using Speak to COPD, a sub-study. It's a flash mob research on um, World COPD Day. 20th November uh, 2024. And the idea of a flash mob research is to have a certain period in time for us, specifically one day, uh, where we want to collect as many data as possible. So we do this with an online platform, just a site, where they can, um, when there's a questionnaire about some uh, medical data of them, some demographic data, and then we record their voice uh, for a few sentences probably. Um, we recruit in healthcare settings. So we have some contacts around hospitals around the Netherlands, actually also around Europe now, because we just had the ERS conference and uh, they were very enthusiastic about this. And our, my idea with this was to also share the data with other researchers, because we hope to collect a lot of data. So why not share it? Um, so we specifically designed the PIF, so the information form and the informed consent uh, to include a data repository, uh, because we want to employ it in entire Europe, it has to be in multiple languages, correctly translated, of course, and the data repository has to be clear opt-in. They can still participate in the research, um, and they can choose themselves whether to participate in the data repository. Um, one of our feedback from the legal team was that it should be in clear language, that the data can also be shared outside the EU if we give it to other researchers. Um, so that was one of the feedback points. Um, it's also just to make people more interested in COPD and speech analysis. Not a lot of people know that speech contains these um, symptom uh, information and also show some results based on our previous um, research. So we found that pitch and jitter are actually very nice digital biomarkers for a lung attack. Um, jitter is a known voice pathology measure. If it goes up, then someone's feeling worse, usually. Uh, and we also saw this back in our Tacticals data. Um, it's statistically significant. So compared to someone, to someone in stable condition, when someone is having a lung attack, their jitter goes up and their minimum pitch also goes up. So speak to CBD, we already have a demo out, which I will show. Um, it will be on a mobile site because that's probably the easiest way to reach people. And this is just a demo, but they'll have more questions. This is someone with COPD who was kind enough to show to share his voice uh, for a video, so we can give a demo. And here it immediately gives some feedback um, with the features. So it shows the pitch and the jitter. And most interestingly, I think, is that you can clearly see the difference already between someone who's healthy on the right where the jitter, which is the green bar, is a lot lower than the orange and the red bar. The orange bar is someone with COPD in stable condition. The red bar is someone with COPD in exacerbated, so long attack condition. And the COPD patient that we just saw on the left, um, he seems to be a COPD patient in stable condition, which is nice. Uh, but we can see from the right, the healthy person, um, their jitter is just a lot lower, which we expect is a pathology feature. Um, but we think it's nice that uh, this is just very simple Python code. It gets sent to a server, it gets sent back. Um, for now, the recording gets deleted. But I think people will want to see this. I think they will like it. Um, so we kind of uh, get this information, is our idea, it, within the site. Um, so, of course, about their illness and also about their current health status, because we want to make an algorithm based on lung attacks. So we need to know how they're feeling now. Um, one feedback point that I got during the ERS uh, yesterday, actually, was that this is also very interesting for all the other pathologies, and especially the under-resourced ones, because people with those say, illnesses, they feel like there's no research being done. And if we can collect them like this and share the ripple story openly, then anyone who wants to do research can. And I think that's a really nice point um, also about data sharing. 
uh, yeah, and so these are kind of all the people that are involved uh, even now within this. Um, yeah, it's quite quite a big project. Um, thank you for your attention. I think this is the QR code to the site if you want to use it yourself. Uh, make sure you do it in a, not a noisy room because your jitter will be higher and don't you'll be scared. But <laughs> you're probably fine. And uh, feel free to contact me or talk to me today or tomorrow if you have any questions or suggestions. Thank you very much um, for having me here. And I am representing a team of authors that are enlisted here on the slides. And one of uh, the co-authors, the first author, in fact, Anita Lorenz is also here with us. So we will both uh, take questions after the presentation. Um, and the other authors um, are Daniel Krul, Łukasz Mik and Agnieszka Borowiec. Um, Daniel and Łukasz are from um, the Academy, um, the Technical Academy in Tarnow in Poland. Agnieszka is a, uh, is a speech therapist and she runs a speech therapy laboratory in, in Warsaw. Um, and we will uh, present, I will talk about we, a, a portable system for multi-channel audio data acquisition and processing developed um, within a project. Uh, the project was started some time ago and it involves a multi-angle um, analysis of uh, speech and the first of all development of the infrastructure. The title of our project is the examination of disordered speech and primary functions using Articulograph, Carson's AG501 and Acoustic Field Distribution Analyzer. So this is just only one slide about the project to give you the context which we are, uh, which we are, you know, we, which we find ourselves um, developing the, the, the multi-channel system because this is the only, just one of a range of tools that we need to uh, um, include in the whole framework, it's, which is very multimodal and multi-angle, so to say. So we're in with each um, um, participant, patients, uh, in most cases, we uh, conduct um, uh, an introductory interview. Uh, there is a neuro with logopedic and myofunctional diagnosis, uh, an orthodontic diagnosis, the physiotherapeutic diagnosis as well and then the articulographic uh, study with the EMA and acoustic field distribution analysis. Uh, so the multi-channel audio uh, recordings and analysis, which we are going to focus on uh, today. Uh, so we call it uh, AFDA, INIA, or AFDA, INIA, and uh, I will just reveal the abbreviations in a second. Um, we also uh, record video, um, but today I would like to focus only on this multi-channel acoustic uh, tool and we will do it in, and sh share it by presenting um, some case studies, uh, the preliminary case studies um, that we did using that tool. So uh, those two um, abbreviations, uh, for now we are using them as working abbreviations within the project, come from uh, Acoustic Field Distribution Analyzer and Integrated Non-Invasive non -invasive Analyzer. And this INIA thing was an, an invention of our, of the main um, uh, constructor of this, uh, of this device, which you can now see in the screen. Um, and it also um, denotes a dolphin, as uh, Daniel Krul, who, yes, he's the, the father of the term. <laughs> uh, this is an Amazonian river dolphin who ha uh, that has a very special um, capabilities of hearing. So that's why uh, he thought and he agreed that this is a nice idea to call a device that is supposed to kind of hear more than the regular ears. And we would like to show today that it is really the case in, and also in therapeutic uh, settings uh, based on what we did preliminary. So this device is um, a second prototype. The first one was uh, integrated uh, and fixed to an articulograph, uh, an older version of, of the articulograph. And you will find publications on that by Anita and colleagues. And this one is, um, is a 
fire um, resolution and also which what is very important it's portable and it's really really uh light um in the oh okay in the procedure because i wanted to show you the slides since i'm talking about that this looks like this so it really it isn't really uh you know bulky equipment it's a it's a small uh tripod uh that you can use a tripod um stand and and use it on a table so that's the side of it size of it and but going back to um to, to how it works what you can see here is two things one is the device itself and the other one is the screen of uh, uh of a computer uh, uh the display of a computer program uh so that's a uh, package of a device, a hardware, and an application. And now I would like to show you, oh, I'm sorry, the sound is not necessary. So I will be showing uh, a little bit, uh, a piece of video, it will be not, uh, I will not show all of that, all of that, but uh, just a fragment showing how it, um, how it works and just uh, explain a bit. Um, you will be able to access the link to the whole video via the slides that will be shared by DLAC because what we are going to do is to share all the slides as well based on, on the agreements of all presenters. So uh, this one also is going to be shared. So here you can see uh, the screen and the dolphin, of course, and uh, we will see the visual uh, presentation in the software of the word Latami in Polish. So you can see the timeline now once it moves and uh, the, uh, the um, astrogram uh, uh, in the upper part. Here in the corner, in the top right corner, you can see the speaker's face and the yellow dot here shows you the, 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 the maximum energy. So uh, you can see for now, it's mostly, yeah, and now it jumped up as you could probably see. So uh, I can move it just a little bit back. So you can see most of the uh, the sound in the word Latami are typically, when the standard pronunciations is realized, they are oral. So we are in the middle, near the mouth. Once we have a nasal resonance, it just jumps up or to the, if it's regular. If it's irregular, we can have uh, differences. So uh, that's basically the main um, part for the functionality. And now I will briefly uh, show you uh, a bit more about that device and the, the software. So uh, here are, are some technicalities. Um, the, the, the main contributor of that is not here, but I will just tell you that there are six, 16 uh, microphones based on a microelectromechanical system. And those 16 little microphones are on the uh, microphone array. Uh, and also this device, what it uses, that uh, um, can be interesting, it uses a laser uh, distance sensor that compensates from for the slight movement of speaker head, speaker's head or the face shape, for example. All right, so uh, it doesn't the person the speaker does not need to be fully like filled when when speaking right um and all those images and sounds are then after well in uh real time they are sent to the application through an usb device and can be then analyzed using those algorithms we signed here in the slide several new alg algorithms that um were exchanged compared to the previous version of the prototypes so they are newer and more precise, uh, better suited to the direction of the energy distribution. Yeah, so that's uh, how it looks in the lab. Uh, so the speaker, uh, generally what's important here, the speaker just sits in front of the device. They can see the big screen that you can see in the back and the laptop is only for the for the beginning and then it's only seen by the experiment and we have for the disordered speech 
we uh, because in the in the project we collect data from uh, mostly from uh, 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 patients experiencing disorders uh, in terms of primary functions, so swallowing, for example, and then we uh, look at the combined or coexisting speech disorders. So this is the kind of patients we uh, we have. And here, for example, we can see a person experiencing. So what what we are showing here is that the, the lady, that's a 15 years um, old uh, person, uh, uh, female, she was diagnosed um, with a body asymmetry in terms of uh, torso asymmetry, head asymmetry, um, and left-sided body posture uh, asymmetry as well. Yeah. Um, and resulting primary function, you know, non-symmetrical uh, behavior. This is correlated with her speech laterality. So uh, it can be observed also in these photographs here. The articulation is to the right mostly. Uh, so in terms of bite, of key alignment, tongue positioning, and more. And for the INIA, for this our for our device that I was um, uh, showing you a moment ago, we can see the outcoming picture. So uh, what we can see is that even in the um, typically uh, oral uh, and typically central uh, uh, sounds, this person exhibits laterality because this yellow dot you know, happens to be mostly on one side and in some cases, uh, yeah, even, uh, even you know, this pairs to, to, to both to, to the middle and, and the sides. For the case study two, we have a person, we have a pa patient with, with out, uh, during outgoing um, therapy that exhibits hypernasality, uh, a 16 year old person, a male, uh, he came to speech therapy as a you know side effect of his orthodontic treatment. Uh, it was noticed that he uh, uh, he realized that most of his sounds in a nasalized way. So uh, and it was very uh, clear when the uh, speech therapist uh, uh, started to analyze this that it's really due to. Uh, uh, insufficiency in, in control uh, in the functioning of, of his bellum. It was all, uh, well, it re which resulted in the incomplete closure of all those structures. It can be seen that only with the spatula you could um, even see the um, that organs. So the hypernasality can be seen here. You can see the pictures from Enya. And all those sounds that you can see in the selected uh, picture, this is a continuous utterance, they should not be nasalized, but they are. And what is important, and also in next, the last one, uh, case study, which I will show you, is that many of these cases, and here you can see our third um, case study by uh, seven children. Um, these children were hearing uh, impaired, and they exhibited both. So both hypermetallity and laterality. And what is important to say here is that many of these phenomena were not, well, for the, for the therapies, were not, you know, possible to be uh, noticed by other means. So this uh, tool, uh, and we are, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we are collaborating with a speech therapy uh, lab and also orthodontist and so on. So they noticed um, the phenomena or some symptoms of them in other contexts, but in many contexts, in many realizations, they would not notice because um, by means of auditory means or other observational um, means, these would not be easy to spot once with this aid of uh, the visual display of those energy uh, distributions, it's um well, it's a it's a help, it's an uh, assistance, right, for 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 the therapy, for the for the development of 
an improvement uh, of the speech of the, the patient. So that's um, these are the, the three case studies. We show that we can somehow assist um, in uh, detecting quite easily and really non-invasively because the person is not attached to any uh, um, device. The, 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 the system is quite portable, so it's, it's relatively non-invasive. We can distinguish between several central and lateral realization. We can uh, look at the, the, the both horizontal plane in in, in those um, energy distributions and vertical as well. So um, we are in the middle of the project. I would say uh, the system that that's the first version and the outcomes and the pictures and the the, the analysis are from the first part of the project. Um, so we are looking forward to 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 the future developments for now. Well, this is qualitative mostly, right? Because we can see uh, individual cases, we can assist uh, therapists as a you know as an additional source of information. But in fact, behind the pictures, there is also you know if we collect enough data, also to share. Um, yeah, we will be able to, you know, draw some statistical results, but not for now. For now, this is really case studies with the case by case analysis, so to say. And for sharing the material, as we mm, talked about that before, uh, it will be shared via the repository for so university after the project. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. My name is Marina Ruiter. On behalf of our project group, which also includes Henk van den Heuvel, I'd like to present our ongoing research project called Corpus-Based Research into Intra- and Interpersonal Language Variation in People with Aphasia. I will focus on the aphasia speech corpus that we are creating within this project and that we intend to share with other researchers upon completion of our project. Before presenting the details of the corpus and the way we collect the data, I will briefly introduce the rationale of our study. Within our research project, we are building a corpus of Dutch aphasic spoken language. Aphasia is a communication disorder that results most frequently from stroke or other damage to the brain. Aphasia has negative implications for the production and comprehension of language, even in mildly impaired persons with aphasia. Aphasia negative, negatively impacts one or two or more language modalities to a lesser or greater extent. It affects spoken language production, comprehension, reading and or writing. There are different types of aphasia, called aphasia syndromes, which can be distinguished on the ability to produce fluent language output, to comprehend language and to repeat spoken language. Communication is key to inclusion, and people with aphasia are vulnerable for communicative exclusion, as their language skills may be severely limited. They typically are unable to improve without language intervention and tools based on speech and language technology to compensate for their language problems. Optimal societal participation for people with aphasia can be achieved either through timely and personalized language intervention, and or suitable speech and language tools uh, based on automatic speech recognition in order to support the, uh, intervention and uh, communication. However, clinical tools and speech and language technologies are to date not optimally effective for people with aphasia. Uh, both clinical prevention measures and speech and language technologies are based on common denominators that are supposed to be true for all individuals with the same aphasia syndrome, which we call, which we call a group level approach. However, people with aphasia show considerable variability in language performance. First, there's variation between speakers with aphasia who are considered to have the same aphasia syndrome, as this slide illustrates. There is no two people with aphasia will have exactly the same language difficulties. This slide shows the spoken responses that different speakers with Broca's aphasia may produce to a picture of a man washing his hands. 
Broca's aphasia is associated with sentence production difficulties, and although all speakers exhibit sentence production problems, their utterances differ with respect to verb inflection and the production of articles. More remarkably, there is also within speaker variability. That is, the same speaker with Broca's aphasia may demonstrate different language behavior in diverse communicative contexts, such as a picture description task depicted on the left or free conversation depicted on the right. Again, sentence production difficulties are observed in both contexts, but verb inflection and article production vary depending on the context. Fundamentally, an understanding of individual variability in language performance is lacking. What mechanisms drive individual variability and how can we best capture, interpret and deal with it for clinical and technological purposes? Therefore, the goal of our research project is to measure and capture these individual differences, especially the within-speaker ones. And this knowledge will in the long term allow improvement of clinical and technological solutions for persons with aphasia, among which are prediction models of recovery. Our ongoing study into language variation in Dutch aphasic speakers shows characteristics of clinical research, but it is coordinated by Radboud University. From an academic setting, it is more difficult than from a medical one to recruit subjects with aphasia. Subject recruitment in our project is therefore time consuming, costly and relatively vulnerable, which increases the value of the data. To make this valuable data more widely usable, we also are building a data repository called the Dutch Aphasia Bank. And we seek to include the spoken language of 50 speakers with aphasia and this database will open up unique opportunities for further aphasia research, both by our own research group and other researchers. This figure provides an overview of the data that we will collect and include in the Dutch aphasia bank. I will focus on the type of tests and tasks administered to facilitate language research, which is depicted, depicted in blue, and speech and language technology development, which is depicted in orange. The repository will consist of spoken language data, and there is not enough time to discuss all the tasks in detail, but the essence is that, in order to elicit spoken language production, Dutch speakers with aphasia will be presented with language tests and production tasks at the word, sentence and discourse level. For our own research purposes, the word and a sentence task will have two conditions, being a constraint and an unconstrained one. And the in, in the constrained condition of the word production task, time pressure is imposed. And in the constrained sentence production task, complex utterances are elicited with priming techniques. In the unconstrained conditions of these tasks, which will be administered before the constrained ones, we do not include time pressure or priming. We expect response variation to be more limited in the constrained conditions as compared to the unconstrained ones. As I just mentioned, spoken language responses will be elicited with various tasks and tests, which will be stored not only as raw scores, but also as audio and video recordings. And these recordings will be orthographically transcribed and annotated in line with the American Aphasia Bank, which is part of the larger TalkBank project. We will use the chat and clan uh, transcription and data analysis software to annotate the transcript. An illustration of this annotation method is provided on the right of this slide. Both our study and the building of the Dutch Aphasia Bank uh, were approved by the Ethics Assessment Committee of the Radboud University after it uh, was or both were exempt from medical ethical approval by an accredited uh, medical research ethics committee. And this means that both uh, research projects are not subject to the medical research involving human subjects, ex the M uh, WMO. 
Regarding the ethics, I would also like to mention that we sought to make the informed consent procedure as aphasia friendly as possible. That is only uh, that is one of the inclusion criteria was moderate to good uh, language comprehension to ensure that participants were able to sufficiently understand the information and provide consent. Uh, secondly, we also informed significant others or proxies. And thirdly, the uh, subject information sheets and the informed consent forms were also created in a aphasia friendly format. That is, we included short sentences and pictograms to support uh, written language comprehension. As I mentioned earlier, it is difficult to recruit participants with aphasia directly from an academic setting, and we therefore used a two stage procedure. First, we ask uh, the intended participant with aphasia permission to contact their current or former speech and language therapist uh, to share relevant medical information and language performance data. And this allows us to determine whether the inclusion, inclusion criteria for the language variation study are met. If so, permission uh, is needed to be given for participation in the study and the inclusion of the data in the Dutch Aphasia Bank, which I'll get, I'll get back to that in a minute. And on average, the two-step informed consent procedure takes about seven to eight weeks per participant. And it's also related to the fact that we have to contact um, the former or current speech and language pathologist or therapist. Um, we have to answer their questions and uh, participants must be given time to come to informed consent uh, to an informed uh, con decision when signing the declaration of consent the participants have four options first they can consent to their data consisting of recordings the transcripts and the metadata uh, only to be used in a language variation study um, secondly they could give permission to store all their research data in the Dutch aphasia bank as well, which is the second option, or they could agree with storage of the parts of a part of their research data in the aphasia bank, for example, by not granting permission to store their video recordings, which is the third option here, or no recordings at all, which is the fourth option. With respect to anonymization, we will seek to keep the recordings as untouched as possible, although we will remove the names of persons and named identities from the audio and the video recordings, as well as from the transcripts. And the metadata that we'll discuss on the next slide will be soon analyzed, and the contact, or sorry, the code list, uh, which we'll use, will be stored separately from the research data. Metadata will provide information on the speaker demographics and includes, among other things, information on the type, severity and the duration of the aphasia, um, any other coexistent speech impairments such as the dysarthria or apraxia of speech, and also, for example, uh, data with respect to age, sex and level of education and handedness. To finish, I'd like to say something about the procedure used to store the data in the Dutch Aphasia Bank and to provide access to other researchers. In line with the Radboud University's uh, guidelines for research data management, the data will be stored at the Radboud Data Repository as a data sharing collection with restricted access. And after a one year embargo period, other researchers can request access um, to the data through a data access committee or DAC and if granted a data transfer and use agreement uh, has to be has to be signed so with this presentation I hope to have illustrated how we collect disordered language data in our study and try to make it suitable for sharing finally I would like to emphasize that that this project is a team effort uh, so on the left you find all the names of the people that are involved in this project, which are Vittoria Pi, Willemijn Doedens, Henk van den Heuvel, Paul Trilsbeek, 
uh, Frank-Erik de Leeuw, Anil Taludar en uh, ikzelf. Uh, and our study is sponsored by the Stichting Afasie Nederland, or the Dutch Aphasia Foundation, the Center for Language Studies and the Adaptive Language Consortium, which are both part of the Radboud University. And I think this also reflects the collaborative and interdisciplinary nature of our research. Well, thank you for your attention. And if you use the QR code on the right uh, of this slide, uh, you can find more information on our research uh, project website. Thank you. We have uh, three wonderful talks, all very interesting uh, around the um, disordered speech. And now we still have a few minutes to discuss. So please, anybody questions online or here in the room? I'll first have the floor uh, in the room and then have an, uh, um, a question in the chat. Um, yes, hello. Uh, it's Martin Matisse from CSC. I uh, have actually a question to Luz and to Marina about the informed consent. So um, I wonder why do you have to use informed consent? Can you? Uh, so this is, uh, to my knowledge, Article 6.1a uh, uh, in the GDPR, but there's also one Article 6.1e, which is um, research for the common good. Is that an option for you? If, uh, and, or if not, why not? Well, I'm feeling excused. I can comment on that a bit. Uh, for us, it's definitely the NREC that says, if you can ask informed consent, then you should. And since these are um, like not healthy people, but um, they have their mind, you know, is that yeah. Yeah. they are able to give informed consent, then yeah. they have to. Is this, yeah. I was, I was going to ask that if this is the case for Marina, but you come from the same country <laughs> yeah it's the same same for us we yes. have to ask permission uh, um yeah yeah it's the same and 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 uh like Luz, where if i understood understood you correctly Luz, you would say that there you also need permission or the informed consent form has to be signed by someone who has uh, education as a clinical researcher so so in, in, in the Netherlands, we also have um, a certificate for those who are involved in medical ethical research. Um, so yeah, we have we have training. And so these rules, how to uh, request for informed consent, how, how to use the informed consent procedure there, we are all skilled to do so in the Netherlands. Yeah. And maybe an interesting note for the rooms was that you can also ask on informed consent online. They don't have to sign it as a researcher. Like there are some exemptions to that. Okay. But the participant does have to give informed consent. But... And there was a just a comment um, that in the Irish context, it's not even allowed to recontact participants unless we have explicit permission to do so, gathered at the time of initial data ga gathering. That's a comment from Nicola. Yeah, I, I can uh, hardly hear you, but uh, I think the question is whether I had to go to the MREC for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, well, most of my research is also um, like a gray shadow, whether it's really under the WMO. So I'm very used to always go to the MREC and ask, um, that's what they call in the induction for vraag. Just a small request. Could you have a look at our research pro uh, proposal, um, our research protocol, the, the patient informed consent forms and the information sheets? And could you please tell me whether uh, this, um, this research is subject to the W? MO. So mm -hmm. and they and, and and that's quite a procedure that sticks on average, I think, two to three weeks. You don't have to pay for it. And then they say no, we exempt your study. Yes. As and, and declare that it's not subject to the WMO. And so then you go go to the in our case to the Radboud University ethical 
committee, but uh, I always go there to check. So, yeah. 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 You had these difficulties with the with the MREC, and so and but for the speed to COPD, um, we're now starting this. I mean, that's outside the scope. Yeah. So um, whether it's in the WMO, so it's subjected to actions or uh, in those rules, yeah. but it also of course is a balance act between how much are you subjecting them to yeah. action, and because speed to COPD is only one time recording, we really hope that we're outside the scope of, of the WMO and. We, I think so, uh, but because Dr. Kels was three times a day for 12 weeks, that's so much action imposed on the subject that it is in the WMO. All, all of the um, talks were very interesting, and, and as I commented after Lois's uh, talk, that there's particularly this technology um, and research interface seems to be uh, very challenging. Um, uh, have you had this experience that that it is somehow more uh, under the scrutiny? The the or it, it, it's the hospitals are even more careful when there's business involved. So uh, when developing the we you meant when developing the the system and so on. Yes, the, inter the interface between. Um, yeah. uh, technology equipment and data, or patient data, uh, when you acquire um, ethical approval for that kind of research, how... how oh, could... yeah. This is uh, when uh, Lois was uh, speaking of her experiences, uh, waiting months uh, for, you know, um, uh, getting it uh, ready for, for the next stage so for actually going to, to, to the work. Uh, it's really similar. Uh, we, uh, I don't know, I don't remember how many pages that was. I mean, for the ethical committee, for the, yeah, it was about 60 pages, all the documents, because we needed to, uh, before we started the work, we, we needed to attach everything. So all the uh, you know, consent forms, uh, uh, information that before uh, the participants and so on. And when you have a multimodal data, that, that's what we also do um, in other uh, projects on multimodality. We always uh, create those multi step uh, consent forms. So, uh, you know, and, and most of the documents have this uh, element of being a multi step. So, uh, both speakers and um, and so some steps of the analysis can be conducted uh, in full range. So all mm. the steps, are, so for example, we can share uh, that they can agree or not agree to the sharing only the audio or the video and so on. We have very good experience with uh, speakers uh, who usually tend to uh, be uh, very happy to share to sign those agreements in full. Um, but when you prepare, when we prepared the, the, the documentation, it was uh, um, the much detail was needed, and the committee had questions. Mm. So, uh, uh, so yes, it's. Um, I would say it's with every device, <laughs> you get you know time. Yes, yes, and I. The documents that you share in the administrative um, way and the. To introduce, to even introduce those, those uh, devices into the, the laboratory discussion. So uh, it gets complicated, but uh, luckily, once it's done, you usually you have the approval and you can go on. So you just need to sort of make it up to reassurance. But Ooh. once you do it, it, yeah. it allows you. Yeah. To go on. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a difficult interface that we are. Moving into this, um, because the data is still, we only can use it for scientific research, right? And not for um, commercial purposes or anything. So that needs to be very clear. Our, yes. Yeah, we need to state it. Uh, yes, the, the, exactly. The purpose. Well, we, we could probably, because that, that's why I, I was asking the word business in your question, because actually you could probably go on and um, try to. Uh, acquire content for other uses, but that would be even more. Yes, which we did not do. It. Yes, so for the, this project, we just stick to the scientific and clinical. Yeah, yep. 
maybe uh, something on that. Um, if you're looking into the validity and the accuracy of the devices themselves, uh, it falls under the MDR, the medical device regulation. But if you're looking into the um, as an investigational product, it does not necessarily fall under the MDR. So it's easier to get the research going. Yeah. So yes. If you only use it in clinical research yes. context. It's easier. Yes. Yes, that's my experience as well. Yes. Um, any comments from online? I think we're we are out of time. Yeah, it's out of time. Yes. Could I ask yes. a quick question? Sure. Uh, I noticed that there are four versions of informed consent form. The participants can only share their the transcriptions with all the audio and video. I was wondering, actually, when we collect the speech and audio data uh, and video data, I, I think the audio and video is very important for our database. If the participant would not share audio and video, then why it's still necessary to keep the transcriptions in the database? Now, uh, if I, uh, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly because the audio was breaking down a bit here, but um, uh, you were wondering whether sharing the audio data is necessary when you have the transcriptions or no, does I, it make any sense? No, I understood. It. Okay. What, what sense does it make if you can only share transcriptions yes. and not the, 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 the raw material? Yeah. And, and sometimes the transcriptions, if they are very narrow, so they really describe the uh, pronunciation process and things that go wrong there, and even perhaps have uh, pauses, uh, time timestamps there, and it's all in the transcriptions. Then it is useful material, uh, and uh, when it's just uh, autographic transcription, uh, leaving out all kinds of repetitions and particular um, uh, phenomena that you see in the ordered speech, then uh, the, the value really becomes very low. That's true. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to share with you our current uh, work. We will release an open source disaster speech data site. Uh, so today's topic is disaster speech data site in Dutch and English for personalized disaster speech recognition. And I'm Yuan Yuan Zhang. I'm a second year PhD student from TU Delft Multimedia Computing Group Speech Lab. And <laughs> Junjun, uh, Dr. Zhong Junyuan here is my supervisor. Um, Today, I will mainly focus on five parts contents. Uh, I will talk about the background of this Austria and also the motivation of we start to collect such a database and also talk about the limitation of existing disaster speech data sites. And we will describe how this data set is constructed and uh, give a brief description of the current uh, collected data. Uh, as we all know, human communication is very important in people's daily life. We need to communicate with others every day. However, there is a group of people who are suffering problems when communicating with others. Disaster speakers are such a group. Disaster is a kind of speech disorder arising from disturbances in muscular control during the speech mechanism. Their speech sounds distorted, slurred, and a bit slow. Uh, a lot of people are suffering from disaster. For example, in China alone, more than 8 million people are suffering from disaster because uh, post-stroke influence. There are also a lot of disease can cause the disaster. I only give an example uh, for one disease for one country. So there are a lot of people has this problem. And the disaster speakers needs voice based interfaces, though their speech is distorted. Because uh, when their disaster becomes worse, they will also have the accompanying physical disabilities, which means it's difficult for them to use the keyboards, mass, smartphones. So if they can use their speech to communicate with others, then it's still very help, very helpful for their life. And uh, among all of these voice-based interfaces, Automatic speech recognition has the potential to help disaster speakers to communicate because from previous research, the people who are familiar with the disaster speaker or familiar with the disaster speech or the disaster speaker's families, they can know the disaster speech well and them, understand them well. 
So if we can use automatic speech recognition to learn the disastric speech, uh, which will be help a lot uh, for the disastric speakers to communicate with machine or people. And uh, there are mainly three challenges for disastric speech recognition. The first two is low resource. Uh, and the second one is the mismatch between the disastric speech and typical speech, which means even though currently we already has a lot of open source typical speech, we still cannot use the ASR model solely trained on such typical speech to perform on the disastric speech. There exists mismatch. So the only solution is to collect disastric speech data. Uh, the second challenge is the high variability, including inter-speaker and intra-speaker variability. What's that? I will introduce it one by one. The first one is the inter-speaker variability, which means for different speakers, different disastric speakers, when they speak the same content, the speech sounds a lot of difference uh, because they are at different stage of the disaster area and their cause of the disaster may be different. Uh, we can have four examples. They all say the same content, but it sounds a, a lot different. Do other cases also were under advisement? Do other cases also were under advisement? Two other cases also were under advertisement. Two other kids also were under advertisement. Uh, that's the inter-speaker variability in disastric speech. And uh, even for the same speaker, uh, when he or she speaks the same content for several times, the speech still sounds different. That's the intra-speaker variability. Nothing in the presented at the end. Nothing in and and the and the uh that's the high variability uh of the disaster speech and to to overcome the high variability uh, we also record videos to capture the deep movements of the disaster speaker um and uh in the Netherlands there is bilingual culture, which means for most of people in our daily life, uh, we mostly communicate with others in two languages, uh, Dutch and English. So we also record speech uh, in these two languages. So finally, we built a disaster speech data site in Dutch and English with the accompanying video recordings. Then I will talk about the limitations of the current existing disaster speech data set. The first limitation is the open source problem. Uh, to my best knowledge, the data sets contain over than 300 hours disaster speech are not publicly available. And even for some small disaster speech data sets, they are also not public. Uh, some of them are also not publicly available. And uh, the designing aims for building this for disaster speech data sets are diverse. Uh, some data sets were designed to investigate the characteristics of disaster speech or access the disaster speech severity level, which means those data sets will have shorter speech uh, or only isolated word. And some data sets was only for evaluating the proposed signal processing methods to improve disaster uh, intelligibility. Um, these Database data sets are not designed for building disaster speech recognition systems. And uh, for the existing uh, disaster speech data set for building ASR system, there are also gaps in speech content, uh, which are the limited inclusion of transcribed sentence level read speech and uh, the transcribed spontaneous speech. Um, 
So the database, the data set we built is open source and designed for personalized disaster speech recognition. It will contain sentence level read speech and transcribed spontaneous speech. Currently, we only have one participant and uh, he is a native adult Dutch male with dysarthria. Uh, dysarthria was caused by acquired brain damage due to high impact trauma. Um, and uh, for both English and Dutch, we have two types of speech, read speech and spontaneous speech. For English following Togo, we also record four kinds of nine words, uh, including hataka, RPE, and we also random selected 102 English words from the Togo. Um, for both English and Dutch, we record uh, sentences with very long for read speech. Uh, we had two kinds of text pool to pro provide the right prompt. The first one is from a uh, well-known data set. For English, we use the library speech as text pool to provide the right prompt. And for Dutch, we use the CGN corpus to provide the right prompt. And uh, we also we also include the participant prepared prompts. Uh, for spontaneous speech, English one, uh, we include random conversation between the experimenter and the participant. And we also ask some open questions to let the participant answer in both English and Dutch. Uh, for Dutch spontaneous speech, by the request of the participant, uh, the participant would like to do some presentations. So we also record that. And. Uh, this is our recording environment. We record the data in the acoustically isolated booth. The mainly recording hardware is uh, a microphone with pop filter and two laptop, two computers, and also a web camera. The first one, the microphone is with a pop filter uh, because we hope to filtering the popping sound. And we keep the distance from the microphone to the speaker's mouth about 20 to 30 centimeters. And the pop filter, uh, the distance between the pop filter and the microphone is about eight to 10 centimeters. Uh, the microphone is used to collect uh, the audios. And uh, we use a Logitech webcam to record the video data. It was put in front of the participant at a distance of one meter. And we have two computers. Uh, one computer is for playing the camera screen, let the participant can see his own face the whole time during the recording to keep uh, in mind that uh, his face is in the camera. And the second computer is to play different tasks. For example, the right prompt for right speech recording the open questions for spontaneous speech recording or the slides for his uh, free pre presentation. And uh, we mainly use the two recording software. The first one uh, is debut. For this software is connected with both the microphone and the camera to keep the same start and end time. Use this button to control the video and the audio recording together. And uh, we also use Logitech camera setting software to adjust the, uh, the size of the camera screen to make sure the whole face of the participant is recorded. And uh, the general protocol for this data set is first we get ASIC approval from the ASIC uh, approval committee in Delft, And then we find the participants we will let the participants to fill in some questionnaire, including uh, with agreement, including the gender, the age, the education level. Uh, they can decide to not fill in some questions if they don't want. And uh, then we will make appointments with the potential participant. After making the appointment, uh, when the speaker comes to Delft, we will read and explain the recording instructions one by one, and also 
uh, let the participant to see and check the informed consent form. If uh, the participant agree to uh, do the recording, uh, we will uh, prepare the experiments. Most of the preparation was done before the participant comes to Delft, including the right prompt and spontaneous task preparation. But uh, when the speaker comes to Delft, uh, we will also in the morning uh, prepare the equipment, the microphone, the camera. After that, we will help the participant to get into the booth because some of the participants may have the physical disabilities. And then after the speaker gets into the booth, because our booth is very small, so after the speaker comes into the booth, we will add a white background uh, at the back of the participant to make sure the camera can record the face and the white background. And we will do some camera adjustment to keep the camera to record the whole face of the participant and also uh, do a short macro test. And then we start the recording. Uh, during the recording, we will have multiple break session. And uh, during the break, the experimenter will check the recorded data by random selection. And uh, after the participant leave our booth, we will also do some random checking on the collected data. And we will also ask for feedback from the participant uh, where we need to improve or uh, how do you feel about today's recording and uh, do some clean up for the environmental, for, for the recording booth. Uh, and we also did data pre-processing. Uh, the audio and video are both saved in the same MP4 format files. And the video was 33 frames per second uh, with this size and in RGB channels. We have a high quality microphone which allows us to record two channel data with 44.1 kHz. And then uh, we use the software to wave converter to uh, save audio in wave format, which is common in ASR recognition. And then we use Prat to do speech annotation, including time stamping and uh, transcription. Uh, why we need time stamping? Because the, when we record it, all the data, maybe 10 or 20 uh, short audios are saved in the same file to save the participants time. So afterwards, we need to segment these recordings into utterance-based level, which are common in ASR automatic speech recognition task. And uh, after do the uh, speech annotation with Pratt software, we, according to the timestamp we have, and we use SOX command to segment the uh, audios into utterance based. And then uh, we also remove the audio track and only keep the video track to get a version of video only data. And then again, based on the timestamping we got, we also use FMPG2 to segment the the videos into utterance based. Uh, during the speech annotation for red speech, first, the experimenter will do one round time stamping. And the, we recruited TA, student TA, to uh, transcribe the red speech with the red prompts because red speech will have prompts. And then the experimenter will do one round check mm -hmm. on the TA transcribed speech. Finally, uh, hi, hi, I can hear you. We have four minutes, it's okay? Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. And then uh, finally, the participant will check on one round only on the participant prepared the right speech because he prepared some right prompts himself. And, f uh, and for the spontaneous speech, after one round of time stamping and uh, transcribing by the experimenter, uh, we also use whisper way two to transcribe for one round and then let TA to check these two versions of transcriptions and revise for one round. Finally, the experimenter will check again. And uh, after most of the confusion words are solved, we will also let the participant to have a check if he would like to help. Uh, for the spelling check, finally, after we do the speech 
annotation, we will use large lexicon like library speech lexicon or CJN lexicon to filter the out of vocabulary words and then do a manual check and uh, revision on the spelling errors to make sure everything in the database is correct. Uh, I can show you two text grade examples because we only recorded disaster speech. For rest speech, the text pool is from open source database. So we will also have the utterance ID from the healthy speech data, data set. So we will include one tier in the text grade field to record that, uh, which will alleviate the effort to collecting the pair pair the healthy speech. And then for spontaneous speech, we only have transcriptions. Um, finally, we also did one round of data processing for the future ASR uh, experiments. Uh, we do data processing, we followed A.V. Hubert to lip region detection with the lip. Um, and then this is the overall, overall information and the data statistics, statistics for both our English and Dutch data. We have both read and spontaneous speech for both language. And we finally have around the five hours English data. And we have around 3.3 .3 hours Dutch data. And we have 43 minutes of spontaneous English speech and 22 minutes Dutch spontaneous speech. The vocabulary size are listed below. Uh, for future work, we will record more data with different uh, disaster speakers. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, please feel free to ask any questions. So we'll do the uh, questions uh, at the end of uh, the three talks again. Um, uh, just one question. Uh, how many speakers did you record? So far, is it one male or...? Uh, Currently, we only have one speaker, but for the single speaker, we recorded in total for uh, about uh, eight hours speech, clean okay. speech without any silent, without uh, a lot of silence and noise, clean speech. And uh, for the data managed plan we wrote, we submitted for the ethic approval. Actually, we plan to have around 50 disaster speakers. Thank you so much. So hi, everyone. I'm uh, very happy to be able to join the, the workshop remotely. So thank you to the organizers for the flexibility and all the organization work in general. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Iris or Iris, and today I'm going to tell you about joint work with Printi, Skunnar, and Hinrik. And we're very much just embarking on our corpora of disordered speech journey. So a lot of what I'll tell you about today is in the form of, you know, future plans rather than actual data, which means your feedback is extremely valuable. Um, and I just want to begin with um, the perspective we're coming from, so which is the, the clinical potential of automatic speech and language analysis for people with speech and language disorders. So this is something we're very excited about because our team is kind of on both sides of the table. Bentis and I are practicing speech language pathologists, but we do research as well. And Gunnar and Hindrik are both on the engineering side of language technology. And we all have a background in linguistics. So I'm an assistant professor of Icelandic and language technology at the University of Iceland. But one day a week, uh, I'm a, a speech language pathologist at the National University Hospital of, of Iceland, where I do clinical work and also some research, uh, mostly with people with, with dementia. Um, and I think it's I think it's safe to say that uh, advances in language technology over the last decade have resulted in a significant push towards exploring this this clinical potential I just mentioned, with maybe two main types of applications in the context of people with speech and language disorders. So the first I think is diagnosis and monitoring primarily for neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, motor neuron disease, um, where we see this work where language sample analysis, so based on picture descriptions, for example, might yield cost-effective, uh, person-centered and non-invasive endpoints for early screening and also just monitoring in general 
and treatment efficacy assessments, including in drug trials. And the second application we're excited about consists of new technology for alternative and augmentative communication for, um, or, you know, AAC aids. So for example, personalized voice synthesis and speech recognition for disordered speech, uh, like we just heard about in the, in the previous talk. So I'll talk about this more in a little while, but in both areas, um, there's been this range of digital health tools which have actually become available to users, but only if they use English or a few other high resource languages. And this is something people are growing concerned about. So for example, uh, Gar Garcia and colleagues in a 2023 paper point to the ubiquity of English in the field of speech and language markers of neurodegeneration and call for linguistically diverse research as well as you know, equitable access to novel clinical instruments globally. And so I think this is a context, you know, where broadly where there's this English bias, which can be problematic for the generalizability of research results. But this also creates a situation where cutting edge health technology is not accessible to people who speak lower resource languages and to multilingual speakers as well. And this is something that is extremely frustrating as a clinician, because you find tools which, uh, you know, seem very promising. And sometimes your patients find these tools themselves, but they're just not accessible to them because they don't speak the right language. So we need more linguistic diversity in research, but there also has to be um, technological transfer and probably innovation, which is centered around um, small languages. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to discuss a few examples of um, state-of-the-art clinical applications um, of language technology for people with speech and language disorders. And I'm going to focus on tools which depend on corpora of disordered speech and language. And then I'm going to talk about what we think are the necessary steps to ensure um, the same resources are available to speakers of, of Icelandic and other small language communities, and maybe multilingual speakers too. And hopefully these are um, steps our team will be taking over the next few years. So for now, we're focusing on two kind of related things, the creation of the Icelandic language biobank, which we think should contain language sample both for uh, AAC uh, development and diagnosis and monitoring, and uh, a web-based semi-automatic linguistic analysis platform designed for speech language pathologists. And this platform will also serve as a, as a data collection tool for audio and text samples. So in general, we intend to leverage clinicians' expertise and robust data collection against data scarcity. And I'll explain this in more detail in a, in a little while uh, when I've gone through my examples. So uh, first up is uh, personalized automatic speech recognition for disordered speech. We've just heard about that. Uh, and the example I want to take is the Project Relay app by Google. Uh, it's still in beta, so the access is limited. But the way it works is that, you know, people with disordered speech report, I think it's 500 sentences, at least in, in one of the previous versions, that was the number, which are then used to train their own personalized ASR model. Uh, and they can then use uh, this model to get close captions for their speech. Um, they can also use a repeat feature with a synthetic voice, and they can use this for voice commands too. Um, so this has been used by people with, you know, more stable speech disorders due to, uh, for example, cerebral palsy or aglosectomy, but people with ALS have also used this and we train the model as their speech uh, degrades. And so um, the Relate app is based on Project Euphonia, where a Google research team has been crowdsourcing this massive corpus of disordered speech. And apparently the, the other big uh, tech companies had also been interested in doing this in order to be more inclusive in their speech recognition. So arguably, I think, for the people who need it the most. So this resulted in Amazon, Apple, Google, Meta, and Microsoft all coming together and funding the Speech Accessibility Project, which is led by Mark Hasegawa-Johnson at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. 
So they collect data from all these groups you see listed there. So Parkinson's uh, and related neurological conditions, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, ALS, and people who have had a stroke. Um, and um, they share it with their funders and other develop the developers, as well as researchers who want to work on ASR for disordered speech. Uh, and I wanted to just point out the fact that they are uh, unable to recruit participants from Illinois, Texas, or Washington because of the state privacy law. So in a European context, this is important. And the only the other thing I wanted to mention is that this only targets English so far. So it supports greater accessibility to speech recognition in big tech if you have disordered speech and speak English. Uh, but we actually had a meeting with uh, Mark Hasegawa Johnson earlier this year, and he was very interested in, in collaborating with researchers uh, working on other languages. So this was one side of the coin, so the, the AAC one. And the other one I want to talk about is uh, tools for diagnosis and, and monitoring. And this is a field that really has exploded. So for neurodegenerative diseases in particular, but other contexts as well. Uh, there's a lot of recent companies out there. I've put two examples on the slide, so Winterlight and Tell. Uh, but you've maybe also heard about oral analytics, key elements, and canary speech. So these are companies which automatically extract linguistic features from audio and text. And a lot of the work coming out of this is in the form of machine learning, kind of bottom-up approaches and classification experiments. But some platforms focus on a few uh, more interpretable features tailored to neurologists and, and neuropsychologists mostly. So that's the TAL app, for example. And we've been reviewing this field and so far we have found no comprehensive platforms designed for speech language pathologists. So not only you know, targeting neurodegeneration, but also uh, post-stroke communication disorders and developmental language disorders. And this is despite the fact that SLPs or um, speech language pathologists or therapists are the main clinical experts in language sample analysis and have been for decades you know, analyzing them uh, mostly manually, even though there is this quite long tradition for standardized and partly automated language sample analysis by uh, SLPs in the field of language development. And so there are some well-established services like uh, SALT out there, but a lot of them actually don't use state-of-the-art speech and language processing techniques. And maybe it's obvious, but uh, I'm going to say this anyway. So all the tools I'm mentioning here are mostly available for a few higher resource languages. So, and the data sets collected aren't usually shared. Um, so we need more data uh, and not only uh, for smaller languages, but there's also this clear need for better data sets in a language like English, where um, speech samples uh, are associated with electronic health records or just more robust and precise health background information. So this is what's being done by the NIH-funded uh, Bridge to AI Voice Consortium in the US, which targets only English. Uh, but yeah, it's very ENT oriented for now. Uh, but this is, I think, kind of, yeah, um, the, the latest um, big scale data collection in this direction. So yeah, I think this has been a glimpse of what we think is happening at the cutting edge, mostly in the US. And now the question is um, how we can answer this call for global equity in access to tools. And um, we, uh, the team behind this paper, we want to try to kind of set things in motion uh, for Icelandic, uh, which can maybe serve as a proof of concept for other low to medium resource languages. And we want to do this by focusing on collaboration with speech language pathologists. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, currently, there's no Icelandic uh, shareable corpus containing language samples from speakers with communication disorders, although um, there is one in preparation. There's going to be a paid, uh, poster from the ACO project at the Claren conference in a month, um, if you want to see that. Uh, but yes, we have a lot to do, and there are some limitations which are kind of uh, related to being a small language community. So, for example, um, 
So there's less than 400,000 Icelanders. That means that, for example, we have only 20 to 30 people living with motor neur neuron disease in Iceland at any given time. So what are we going to do? Um, we want to create the Icelandic language biobank. So this would include data both for AAC development and diagnosis and monitoring tools. So we think it's necessary to have this kind of one-stop approach for a language like Icelandic and draw on both uh, the speech accessibility project and bridge to AI voice initiatives to kind of maximize the potential of the data. So the Icelandic language biobank would um, include language samples from individuals with speech and language disorders uh, and symptoms not only disorders and hopefully a lot of controls too, like in the um, EVA project in Slovakia, if you're familiar with that, and some relevant clinical background information too. So we want to be able to gather data from clinicians and also uh, through some crowdsourcing efforts. Uh, so we have a lot of work ahead and problems we need to address, mostly when it comes to data protection, you know, and, and therefore data sharing. Um, so the idea still is to have this layered approach as we've seen today in other talks. So with participants opting into different levels of data sharing for different groups, allowing, for example, um, AAC developers to have controlled access to simplified or just no clinical information through a data user agreement, while researchers could access more extensive information uh, also under a data use agreement. And some participants might be interested you know, in sharing everything, while others only want to share texts or features. So text, it, you know, even a transcript is interesting in the context of uh, language biomarkers of dementia, for example. Uh, so the general idea is to have room for, for all these options. And what we want to do is to collaborate with SLPs uh, on data collection. And we think this should be a, a two-way street where the SLPs benefit not only long-term, but right away with technological transfer. So we're building a hopefully useful and free platform for semi-automatic language sample analysis, which is tailored to, to the SLP needs and their expertise because they can edit a lot manually. So it, that's crucial when your language doesn't have the best ASR or the best uh, part of speech tagger, the best parser and so on. So the idea is that we offer this platform with a range of tasks uh, for children and adults and the SLPs have access to automatic extraction of a range of acoustic and lexical features and they can visualize the data, show it to their client too and export it for the establishment of a baseline and to monitor progress. And if they want, they can present their client with the option of participating in research and donating their samples to the Icelandic language biobank. Um, and then if, if they are interested, there would be an interface for that with electronic signatures of consent forms and so on, so on the platform. So for now, this is uh, only an idea. Uh, we've done some mockups, and last week we had our first focus group um, with SLPs working with adults in the hospital setting, which confirmed that they very much want to use language sample analysis more. We know it's a very good type of assessment, but uh, people don't use it because it's too time, no, they don't use it enough because it's too time consuming and, and uh, tedious to you know, count nouns uh, and calculate syntactic complexity manually. So we usually just stick to this kind of general perceptual level. Um, so they were also um, interested in collaborating with researchers on data collection, but they stress the need for a clear and accessible protocol for the clinician. And we have another focus group tomorrow, focusing on the pediatric setting. So we're very excited about that. Uh, and the last point I wanted to make before kind of concluding is that we think another way to address data scarcity for a language like Icelandic is taking longer language samples. So, uh, which, you know, SLPs usually do. And this is kind of uh, a contra the current trend of going as short as possible. Um, I think automatic speech and language analysis really creates the opportunity for more robust data. So maybe we need, you know, large language samples for for small languages. Oh yeah, uh, there's also a lot of scientific potential. I mean, I guess I don't have to 
tell you, but you know, I think there's a lot to gain in terms of finding out what's language specific and what's language universal in manifestations of diseases and disorders. So, for example, a lot of what we know about primary progressive aphasia um, subtypes is heavily biased towards English, uh, which harms the research and um, uh, also therapy, I think. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot to do on the memory language interface, the genetic underpinnings of communication disorders and just speech and language in general. And I could go on, but so these are my conclusions. Uh, collecting and sharing more cor corporate disordered language and speech is greatly needed. And we believe that collaborating with clinicians such as speech language pathologists has a lot of potential in that respect, scientifically and clinically. Uh, and particularly in contexts of data scarcity. And please uh, tell us about all the flaws you see in our ideas as soon as possible. Uh, send me an email if you have the time, because it's really now is the time to get things right, right, before we do uh, a lot of things that we'll regret further down this journey. Thank you. So this talk is about it's not about collecting data, it's about what you might do with the data sets uh, after you've got them. Um, we've created a resource called STAR, and STAR stands for Speech Therapy Animation and Imaging Resource. Um, it makes use of decades worth of um, ultrasound tongue imaging data that we collected, or rather my colleague Joanne Clellan collected uh, from children with speech sound disorder. So um, in the presentation, I'm just going to talk about what were our aims, uh, what does STAR contain, what are the different modalities that we use to represent the, the moving vocal tract, um, who funded us. It's a bit of a, a jigsaw puzzle of funders, like small bits of funding from here and there. Who are our project team? Um, what were the ultrasound tongue imaging source data sets that we made use of? Um, I'll talk a wee bit about our modelled disordered speech corpus, which might be of less interest to you because it's not real disordered speech. Um, but I think it's, it's MRI speech, so it's useful because it gives you more contextual information about the vocal tract. Um, and then I'll move on to a tour of the websites. So I should probably say that um, I just posted on X about them a couple of days ago. So they, they're they now live and they're out there and they still, things need fixed. Things aren't working properly, but um, for better or worse, the, the sites are live. Okay, so what is on STAR? Um, STAR is essentially to, oh, did I talk about aims? I've missed a, I missed a slide, sorry. Should talk about my aims. There are, two broad aims so there are two websites that we created the first one developed from a website called seeing speech which you might have heard of or you might not have um, seeing speech is a phonetics teaching resource where we wanted to provide um, vocal tract imaging videos so that um, uh, phoneticians people who are training in phonetics would be able to look at the moving vocal organs as well as just having audio input. Um, and the set website we've created, which is called STAR, is very much a clinical phonetics extension of that. Additionally, we have another website that we're calling Speech STAR, and that's for use in clinic with speech and language therapists for children who have speech sound disorder. And that, that is very much animation focused. So we considered that the animations were the, the clearest way to communicate how the vocal organs were moving. So we have these two, we have these um, two websites with two different aims. One is for training speech and language therapists, and that's probably the most relevant for this audience. And the other one is for use in clinic. Um, moving on, so what do the sites contain? Um, we have lots and lots of ultrasound tongue imaging recordings of children who have different, uh, who have speech sound disorder with different diagnoses. And these come from data sets that have been collected over the past 20 years uh, by my colleague, um, Professor Joanne Cleland. 
uh, some of them have additional um, lip recordings, so um, a headset mounted lip camera so you can see the lips moving. Uh, most of them it's just ultrasound. We additionally have uh, modelled disordered speech, uh, for example the sounds of the Xtipa chart and these are obtained from a single model talker um, and imaged with mid-sagittal MRI. We have uh, a limited set of vocal tract animations that are based on the MRI recordings. And again, uh, that's material on the Xtipa chart. And then finally, we have um, a video of therapy sessions with uh, a child with repaired cleft lip and palate. Um, so maybe if I show you these pictures here, it's a nice kind of visual representation of what we have. Um, if you look in the top left, we have uh, 271 MRI recordings uh, from a single model talker. And then below on the left, you can see uh, the animation that's based on the MRI. And you can see that the animated head is very similar to the MRI head. So we created a um, an animated head rig that was overlaid onto the MRI and then animated frame by frame on top of it to create something that would be just a lot clearer to look at with a higher frame rate. Uh, for the MRI recordings, the audio was recorded in situ. So, um, and we had to do noise cancelling afterwards. So the, the audio can be a bit tinny and we're in the process of overdubbing all of the MRI uh, recordings and some of the animations as well. Um, we have lots and lots, if you look at the bottom right, we have lots of these uh, ultrasound tongue imaging recordings. Um, you can probably see here that you can only really see the, the surface of the tongue with ultrasound tongue imaging. Um, the green line represents a palate trace um, that is obtained during a swallow of water at the beginning of a recording or a tongue press against the palate. And you can add a trace to that um, outline of the palate and superimpose it on the video. But apart from that, there's very little in the way of uh, contextual information about other parts of the vocal tract. You can't see the lips unless you have lip camera. You can't see the velum. Uh, moving and that's why we um, I obtained further funding from another funder to record um, MRI because it just gives you a lot more contextual information and we were also able to make some composite videos that show the ultrasound and the MRI together so that you have a better idea of what's missing and how the tongue uh, is orientated in the vocal track. Um, our funders, our main funder was the Economic and Social Research Council Secondary Data Analysis Initiative. So <clears throat> this is a COVID project. Um, I was applying for funding for a completely different research project when COVID hit. And I realised that I wouldn't be able to collect any data. And thinking about how we could work with secondary data um, and we attained funding this way. And then the Royal Society of Edinburgh funded our data collection of MRI modelled uh, non-disordered and disordered speech. And then finally, um, the EPSRC's Impact Acceleration Account funded the creation of um, a visual biofeedback therapy session with ultrasound. Um, so that's also available on one of the websites. Um, our project team is here. So I'm the PI of the project and it's now completed, it's finished, over and done with. Um, my colleague Joanne Cleland was the clinical co-I on the project, so I'm not a speech and language therapist, um, I'm a phonetician. Um, my colleague Jane Stewart-Smith at the University of Glasgow is the digital humanities co-I. We had a really great web designer, Brian Aiken. Uh, Gemma Cartney was our RA. Our animator is Gregory Leplatre and our model talker was Professor Janet Beck, who is a um, a clinical phonetician and a, a trained SLT as well. So here are the data sets that we used. The data sets for um, ultrasound are always comparatively small because setting up the ultrasound recordings, recruiting participants is quite an involved process. So um, you end up with less data in general and often you have to discard data because it's just not usable. Um, the top two rows are um, data sets that I collected of 
uh, English is from around the world, so mostly adult speech, uh, non-disordered speech. Most of it has lip camera video. Um, the four bottom rows that are in a lighter colour, these are the um, disordered speech databases. And you can see that one of them was collected way back in from 2011, um, and the most recent one in 2020, ending in 2020. Um, there are reasonable numbers of children uh, recorded in these data sets. Joanne very cleverly built in um, to the, the consent forms that they could consent to have their speech and their ultrasound recordings put made available online. And most of these data sets, I think the there was an Ultrax data set earlier that was um, that has been donated to the Claren uh, database as well. So most of these data sets are available elsewhere in a, a raw form. Um, often that means having access to the software that we use to record them. So the public doesn't generally um, have access to even the data sets that have been made available online. So our idea was to go in to cherry pick examples of speech errors or sentences spoken with speech sound disorder, um, turn them into videos, annotate them, edit them, uh, add metadata, and then put them into filterable databases so that somebody who's teaching clinical phonetics can go in and easily find an example of a, of a kind of speech error. Um, as I said, uh, Royal Society of Edinburgh funded us uh, to record more MRI recordings and it was just, it was something that I just decided to do because I was looking at all of these ultrasound recordings where there's so little information about the rest of the vocal tract. And I thought, like, people really need to be able to see the, all of the vocal tract. But it's very difficult to recruit participants to go in an MRI machine and there are extra levels of ethics. So we had one single model talker who produced a lot of examples of, of non-disordered speech and then some examples of model disordered speech as well, such as um, disordered variants of S and R sounds. So now I'm just going to give you a tour of um, maybe one or two of the websites. I think you'll be more interested in the, the top one there. Um, so I'll just switch over to that. Hopefully you can all see, yeah. You can see the website. Okay, so if you look in the top right hand corner, um, you can see there are tabs that let you move easily between the different websites we've created. So Seeing Speech is the existing phonetics teaching resource. And then we have something called Dynamic Dialects. That is an Anglophone accent variation uh, database. Then STAR is our clinical phonetics uh, teaching database. We have various introductory information, including very importantly, the licensing information. So that makes life a lot easier for the the research team because we were constantly, particularly for the, the animations, being approached by people who want to use the materials or reuse the materials. So the licensing information makes it more clear what they can do. Um, our position is usually, um, if they're going to use it commercially, the, the animations commercially, they have to, um, they have to buy a license, but otherwise, for if they're not going to charge money for this, they can make use of the animations. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see uh, we have about the project with information about the data sets that underpin the resource. We have our clickable extripa charts, which are quite complicated. Um, so we have a pre-2015 extripa chart and a post-2015 extripa chart. And we have three different modalities here. So MRI1 was collected in 2015, and if I play you an example, you'll see the image quality is quite poor, but the audio quality... Atha. Atha. E -P. When we went back and collected more, um, this is the MRI2 data set, uh, we, ha we had much better quality MRI, but the audio that's attached to it is the audio that we recorded in the MRI machine. So we have uh, recorded audio to overdub onto that 
MRI, those MRI2 recordings, but we haven't yet completed that. Then we have um, animation. Um, so if I click on the same sound. Uh -huh. So this, I think, would be helpful for training um, speech and language therapists. Then we have the um, same thing with, uh, with the IP chart. If you go into the other symbol section, the, the main thing that we added at the request of um, speech and language therapists was um, the English Africa's Chittenja. They kept saying to us, there no, there's no Chittenja here. We were saying, well, they're not part of the IPA chart, but they were very insistent on having the, having, um, the Africa, so we have added them in. The meat of the website are these multimedia speech databases. Um, we have a non-disordered speech database with um, Englishes from around the world that's filterable, so you can go filter by accent if you wanted to show an example of a particular um, speech sound. But probably you're being more interested in, um, here we have the disordered child speech sentences database, which again is filterable. So you can filter by age and speaker codes and gender, or you can filter by diagnosis, which was given by the speech and language therapist that referred the child to um, to Joanne Cleland for the research project. Um, you can click on, so here I've selected phonological impairment. You can select up to four to play in a block and then click on open selected videos. And then you have um, the recording. Some of them have um, lip video inserted at the side, although in this particular case, the lips are quite obscured by the headset that was worn to stabilize the ultrasound probe. Um, so here we can see the target sentences, Kenny drank a tiny tin of Coke. Telling to run a tiny tin of Coke. And you can slow play as well. If you click on the bottom, you can slow play it. Telling to run a tiny tin of Coke. And then we have um, the child speech area database, which is a bit more substantial. So um, you could just go down, you'll see each of the, the error types is listed in alphabetical order. So we have affricate stopping, affrication, alveolar backing, assimilation, and so on. Um, and uh, again, you can filter. You can filter by speech sound. You can filter by its position in the syllable. Um, you can filter by place of articulation or by error type. Um, if you look on each of the rows here, uh, we can see that the sound here was giraffe. Now, unfortunately, um, although some of the some of the utterances contain more than one speech error, we were only able to pick one key speech error to to filter by. So any other speech errors are listed as metadata, but they're you can't you can't search for those errors within that word. So we've got the word giraffe. The key sound is j. Um, its place of articulation is post alveolar. It's an onset sound. And then we have a phonemic transcription. Um, this is partly because most of the children in the data set are Scottish English speakers. So it gives a bit of an expectation of what the, the phonological target is. Um, we have a phonetic transcription, which is blacked out. And that's to allow you to listen to the sound and have a go at transcribing it. And then you can click on uh, the blacked out section to see the phonetic transcription that we've added to it. So we can see that giraffe has been produced as goa. So if we click on uh, the example and press play. Giraffe. Giraffe. You can see there's something funny going on with the front of the tongue that's not particularly audible. So that's maybe one advantage you have of having ultrasound tongue imaging as well. Um, there are cases where there are covert articulations that are not audible, um, which I've tended to include in the transcription. Um, so these are the main clinical. There's some other, um, should show you the, the MRI modeled speech corpus. So 
um, if I click on model disordered productions, we have examples of different kinds of R production in the word RAM. I'll just play that for you here. RAM, 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 RAM. And so that's the main disordered speech content there. The other the other data sets are, are basically non-disordered speech. And then just quickly, I'll show you, if we click here, we go to the second website, which is for use in clinic. And the idea there is that it's easy for kids to, it's colorful, it's bright, and it has simplified resources. So we have IP and Excipa charts for therapists. Uh, we have speech sound animations, um, the, the speech sounds of English um, here we have um, sets of different um, English consonants grouped by place and manner of articulation. And then um, you can go and have a look at this yourself. But we have um, a little video of ultrasound tongue imaging therapy. We have some composite videos showing how ultrasound and MRI relate to one another. Um, and I think that's my time up. Uh, thank you very much for all your presentations. And my question is to Iris. Um, is there any scientific literature publications or books in Iceland on communica communication disorders? Are there any dictionaries um, of medical terminology in Icelandic? So uh, I'm asking because, for example, in Belarusian, um, most medical books and uh, publications are either in uh, Russian or in English, and there was an attempt to. to to produce to create a dictionary of uh, Belarusian terminology. Um, the attempt failed. And since then, we have a saying let you be treated medically according to Varanets dictionary. So, uh, probably the situation in Iceland a bit a bit better because, if, uh, as far as I know, there is a um, agreement between Chat GPT and Icelandic government um, and they try to find some Icelandic equivalents to um, English words. So so you're asking about uh, terminology publications in Icelandic uh, publications about speech and language disorders yes. in Icelandic yes. and resources kind of which are uh, language specific. So um, yes, we have a uh, uh, terminology bank for uh, speech language pathology uh, in Icelandic. So with uh, with the English equivalent terms, um, there's not a lot of literature that's kind of uh, in Icelandic. If that's what you're what you're asking about but i have been wondering so when we did this review of the field uh and we were looking for different platforms available for speech language pathologists uh, i did wonder if we were kind of missing things uh which are available in languages we don't speak so for example i'd be curious to know if there's like a, a russian automatic uh, speech language uh, analysis platform or you know a polish one or a dutch one um i would be very interested uh to know about i mean i would be interested in, in knowing about these resources because i i do know that there's a lot of um materials out there for speech language therapists and patho and pathologists which kind of doesn't uh, make it to the international research community, and there's still a lot of value in those resources. Um, so yes, please let me know if you know about something like this. And yes, we'll and then I'll I'll use machine translation because yes, Icelandic is kind of becoming a medium resource language in terms of availability of things like uh, large language models, which you mentioned. So I hope this answers the question. I didn't. The audio is not. Great here for the yes, microphone uh, questions. Yes, but... Very, very satisfied with the answer. Um, but maybe someone would like to follow up on this, Marina? 
Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question uh, for Iris uh, also. Well, thank you for your uh, interesting talk. And I think it's a great idea to use the calls platform to collect data. But might I have missed it, but how or where does the medical device regulation comes in? Because I think you need certification to use the calls platform. So you need uh, efficacy of that it works and you then you have to do research on the calls platform before you can use it in a clinical setting. And then you um, and then you will use the call system to collect research data. So I think it's a good idea, but it's, for me, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. So where to start or where do you think you need a medical device regulations or how will you comply with these rules? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think, I think it kind of depends on how we frame this. Um, really, like as a speech language pathologist, and I don't know if that's your um, experience as well. Uh, I feel like we do a lot of things manually that could be automated, and in some cases, we use uh, we can use resources which uh, aren't really medical devices, right? So. You can use simple text processing, um, you know, shortcuts to count things. And, you know, we use, um, mm -hmm. clinicians use, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, all sorts of different kind of technology to, to make their job easier. So when does something become uh, uh, a medical device, I think is a crucial question. I think... Yep. There are so many low hanging fruits in terms of language technology for speech language pathologists that some things just need to be made available. Uh, and of course, there needs to be a very clear kind of uh, data um, privacy policy. But the, for example, in Iceland, the, the situation in Iceland now, if you want to use ASR for kind of, for example, transcribing uh, language samples, then the available tools are commercial, right? So that's not safe for clinical data and people aren't necessarily aware of that. So, I mean, our goal is kind of to go through with everything, you know, do the research, uh, do the validation, because that's what we need uh, as clinicians, right? But I think that we, it shouldn't stop us from making some low hanging fruit uh, kind of uh, solutions available even though it's not labeled as a medical device it's just like you get a tool as a speech language pathologist to just measure silence in a language sample and it's already uh useful just a speech activity detector and if it's presented in the right way uh if a patient all of a sudden speaks 50 percent of the sample versus you know 20 percent when doing a picture description six months ago it's useful so we need to get the tools out there and also do the research and do it by the, all the right channels. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how we will do it, but I want to do it. Yeah, I think you, like you say, how you describe it, whether it's a tool that a clinician might use or whether it's some kind of a replacement of a clinician, that's also a way to have a look at it. But I think I totally agree. Well, thank you very much. It's a useful interaction. Uh, you should keep communicating. But there's also Stuart who would like to add something here. Hi. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to answer a question. <laughs> if that was okay, because I was just. It was just Marina was saying about. Um, oh, I'm very sorry. My dog now wants to answer the question as well. I don't know if you can hear her. Sorry about that. Um, that. Uh, can I go and get rid of the dog and then I'll come back? Because otherwise <laughs> she'll probably make far yeah. too much noise. She's just woken up because I've started talking. Okay, then perhaps Martin, you would like to ask a question and then you will get back to you soon. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks. I have a question for Iris as well. Um, I noticed that you said you have, in some cases, only 20 to 30 patients in the whole country. And so I assume that if you assume that you don't reach all of them, it's almost impossible to anonymize or otherwise protect their privacy. And I wonder, is that, do you have in Iceland also a chance because your ethical boards are smaller? So, so uh, basically they have to agree to a certain level of research if 
this research is, has to happen at all. And so is that also a chance? Mm, yeah, I hadn't thought about the kind of uh, limited uh, clinical population sizes as a privacy issue, but it definitely is when you when you say it like this, I realize. Um, I think uh, we'll have, you know, troubles, and it's good that we'll have troubles getting through the bioethics committee here in Iceland, um, uh, despite of the kind of, you know, necessary maybe compromises that we'll have to do due to the the small size of the language community uh, but what I will say is that there is there has been um, this tradition of kind of um, using the small size of the Icelandic population and the the homogeneity of um, of the population too as kind of a um, a way to make progress um, scientifically. So we have, for example, this um, very large um, genetic data set of the population where, you know, there's been some interesting things in terms of uh, data privacy and bioethics. And I think we'll be able to maybe um, use some of their resources in terms of how they secure data and how they approach this problem. So one of the collaborators for our project works um, at this um, company research uh, institution called Deco Genetics. So I don't know, hopefully we'll be we'll be able to do the, this and and there's you know there's an Icelandic language technology program. So there is this kind of acknowledgement uh, that some things need to be collected for Icelandic, um, kind of regardless of the way it's usually done uh, in other places, but hopefully they'll give us a hard time though, the bioethics committee. Not too hard. <laughs> Stuart, uh, last question and you may ask me. Thank, thank you. Um, sorry about the dog. Um, sorry, I was just going to chip in about the medical device discussion just because I have a bit of distant experience with this, which was that really what you need to evidence depends on your claim so if you're not claiming that it's giving you medical feedback or it's going to give you feedback that's the helping in diagnostic situations and it's only a support to the therapist for instance then you can often only evidence safety which is does it work and does it not give you erroneous things so you don't necessarily have to go through the complexity of gaining the the sort of the efficacy uh, data safety data can be easier so it just can sometimes depend on what you're claiming you're going to use it for 